Every year, megalanic penguins make landfall on this remote coast of South America. They've swum over 1,500 miles from wintering grounds in the Atlantic. These are their first steps on dry land for six months. And like the explorers who first surveyed this desolate coast, they cautiously advance inland. Here, the penguins will breed, not on a snowbound shore, but on the edge of a parched wilderness, vanishing beyond the horizon. Strange animals live here, following the fortunes of their changing land. A forgotten world, full of marvels, at the uttermost end of the earth. The explorers called it Patagonia. To explorers, this southern extremity of the new world was wretched and useless. But not so for penguins. For millions of years, they've crowded ashore in September as Patagonia's spring begins. They are all males reclaiming their old burrows dug in previous years and in need of spring cleaning. Some do battle over a burrow. Guarding their burrows, they must wait a couple of weeks for the females, who are already on their way to join them. There are no trees to hide the guanacos, inquisitive about the commotion on the shore. Their ancestors were North American camels, now extinct, but which also fathered the camels of Asia and Africa. Penguins and camels under a South American sky. Patagonia lies in the Roaring Forties, where powerful westerly winds blow from the Pacific across southern Chile and Argentina. Its western boundary is the jagged wall of the Andes. East of the mountains is the dry desert plateau of Patagonia, a quarter of a million desolate square miles. These parched plains eventually meet the South Atlantic, a forbidding shore nearly 2,000 miles long, most of it uninhabited, inaccessible, and undisturbed. However, two secluded gulfs welcome some of the largest animals of the sea. For six months, these shallow bays echo with the sounds of whales. how many dawns have passed since they first found this sanctuary. But here some will give birth, while others begin the slow rituals of courtship, revealing a delicate tenderness despite their bulk. It will be a mating of giants. She's a southern right whale, 40 feet long and weighing 40 tons. He is smaller, and she must clasp him to her while he strives to mate. This other male has been attracted by the female's call and has every intention of displacing her present partner and taking his place.
Spring welcomes other visitors to Patagonia's shores. The rugged isolation has encouraged elephant seals to breed on the mainland. It's remarkable how agile a three-ton bull can be now he has to claim females for his harem and see off potential rivals. He's a beach master and has a dozen or so cows to guard. Under his watchful eye, they are at peace, and only five days after coming ashore, they give birth to their pups. On tap is milk rich in fat. The mother may lose more than half her weight feeding the pup. The youngster grows rapidly, tripling its weight in just three weeks. when the cows are in heat again, just a couple of weeks after giving birth. He's quick to impress her with his charms. He must mate with all the females in his harem and continue to keep other males away. She has lost so much weight, it's perhaps just as well he approaches sideways on. For a while, even after mating, He'll take care not to let her wander, in case she mates with another male. This young male may wait many years for such a chance. It's two weeks since the male megalanic penguins came ashore. Today, the females begin to arrive. Plump from a winter spent feeding at sea 1,500 miles north just off the coast of Brazil. Each female knows the male she pairs with year after year is over the ridge. But how can she find him among thousands? A raucous male fanfare greets the new arrivals. <laughs> Which male is hers just by his call? The reunions are many. It's perhaps six months since they've seen each other, and their language of love takes many forms. When the ritual is done, they'll mate near the family burrow. The neighbors aren't always considerate at such moments. And there's the frustration of the unmated males among such colonial bliss. United again, the penguins will soon be laying their eggs. There's already new life among the whales. Female right whales carve every three years, and many return to the bays of Patagonia to give birth. When born, her calf was over 15 feet long and weighed four tons or so. It's one of the bulkiest babies imaginable. It's already in tune with mother's calls and with others on their Atlantic wavelength. There was a time when this ocean reached further into Patagonia. But 20 million years ago, this part of the South American continent began to rise and the sea withdrew. 
Patagonia slowly lifted out of the ocean. Ghosts of shores like this are now to be seen miles inland. A prehistoric Atlantic washed this beach. Now only fossil clams and scallops of that distant age await a tide that cannot come. And giant oysters baked in stone mark the day the sea was stolen. At that time, South America was an island. There was no land bridge to the northern continent. In isolation, many strange animals evolved, including this giant long-legged guinea pig. It's the Mara, and is about the size of a Labrador dog. They are grazers, and look rather like small antelopes. But no true antelopes ever lived here, and in their absence, the Mara evolved to fit the part. This pup was born 20 minutes ago, and its twin is about to follow. There. Remarkably, both pups will be placed in this communal burrow with the young of several other parents. Her newborn is on its feet almost from birth. Surprisingly, although the burrow has been dug by one of the parents, the adults never enter it again. It's strictly for the young. This newborn pup will now be sent down the burrow to join its twin and others because mother intends to go feeding with her mate. Another couple are ready to approach the burrow. They have pups already there. Only when this mother leaves will the newcomers call to their family. Often all the youngsters come out and one gets punished for trying to suckle someone else's mother. She knows her own pups by smell and refuses to give her milk away to others. The hungry pup tries the same trick again, only this time it's hoping to get milk from the male. It has a lot to learn. This youngster will get no food from strange parents, but is safe while the adults are around. He tries again with this new couple. And this time, it's his real mum. The Mara is a glimpse of earlier ages whose vanished animals haunt Patagonia. Giant sloths, the size of elephants. Camels with trunks. Armadillos, 15 feet long. A whole attic full of evolutionary oddities, all swept into extinction by the changing fortunes of the land. Offshore, they stir the ocean. They create currents that draw nourishment from the deep to feed the innumerable animals of the sea. Anchovies fatten on plankton blooming on the cold upwelling current. Blocks of terns track the shoals. There's good fishing here, and birds in their thousands thrive on it. 
In October, rocky outcrops vanish under a cloak of imperial corners. They choose to nest almost on top of each other and squabble incessantly. There's a good deal of thieving. Seaweed is a valuable nest line. It takes time to collect at sea, so it's labor-saving to pinch it when a neighbor is looking the other way. He even has difficulty carrying his ill-gotten gains. But it is the thieving, the smell, the noise, and the crowding that helps these cormorants breed successfully. Elsewhere, in the rather more orderly penguin colonies, egg laying has been in progress about a week. She's laid her second egg and is taking the first shift at incubation. Her mates feeding at sea. At no time will the eggs be left unguarded. This procession is parents taking turns to go to wash and drink. Drinking seawater is no problem to them. They can get rid of the salt through a gland behind the bill. Penguin feathers are so tightly layered and packed that no water reaches the bird's skin, and air trapped under the feathers insulates them from the cold Atlantic. Thirst quenched and freshly laundered, they're ready to relieve their partners at the nest. But Patagonia is no place for dressing up. The dust of the plains has no respect for personal appearance. Patagonia can be a misery of wind, heat, and dust. Once there were streams, rivers, grassland and forest. 20 million years ago, when Patagonia was lifting out of the sea, this was a wetter land, lush with trees, home to some of the oddest animals that ever lived. But that was to end suddenly, cataclysmically. The new mountains changed forever the climate of the land in their shadow. Clouds bringing rain from the Pacific Ocean meet the Andes and are forced to release their moisture as rain or snow. The clouds are sucked dry before reaching the plains. This rain-shadowed desert is Patagonia's cruel inheritance from the birth of the Andes. The secret of the older Patagonia lay buried until the winds laid bare its bones. Giant trees, their fibers now cast in solid stone, are witness to the cataclysm. Fallen forests, petrified monuments to all that lived around them. The hairy armadillo is a survivor of those days. 
Throughout all the upheaval, it has remained virtually unchanged. There have been armadillos here for at least 50 million years, but its larger relatives, the giant glyptodonts, 15 feet long, were not able to cope with the violently altered land. But hairy armadillos have never been fussy about their diet and can scavenge, kill, or dig up whatever takes their fancy. Those powerful claws, harnessed to an acute sense of smell, are formidable feeding machinery. And their inherited armor of horny scales is almost total protection. The forests have gone, but the desert serves him well. Extinction is not yet for hairy armadillo. Long after Patagonia became a desert, South America ceased to be an island. And across the land bridge from North America walked the camel ancestors of these guanacos. Being camels, they found these dry plains very much to their liking. These guanacos are dust bathing, perhaps to get rid of insect pests. Dust bathing also fluffs out their thick fleecy coats. Every herd finds a place somewhere in its territory where the ground can be scraped out by hoof. This is a guanaco family. One male with several females and their youngsters, now nearly a year old. In a land without trees, burrowing is an essential skill. Penguins, armadillos and maras do it. And so do burrowing owls. This male has left food by its burrow and goes hunting for more. His mate finds his lizard, a snack she gives to the chicks in the burrow. Then she does some hunting of her own. The chicks sense there's more food about. They're growing fast and are only a couple of weeks from fledging. Now is a moment to exercise their wings. They'll go underground if mother leaves. And no one would know they were there at all. It's just past mid-November. Down at the coast, 40 days have passed since the penguins laid their eggs. New life is to be heard in the penguin colony. The chicks are small and weak but instinctively know how to unlock a stream of fish soup from the parent on duty. Fish and squid, half digested, soon have the chicks putting on weight. The parents must now change shifts more often between looking after the chicks and catching food at sea. Both penguins are conscientious parents. Unlike this rear, Patagonia's largest bird, she has a family but has passed all her parental responsibilities to this male. He also incubated all the eggs that several females laid in his nest. He is in sole charge of all the chicks. Baby rears need to drink often to avoid dehydrating as the days get hotter. 
He's incorporated chicks from several other males as well into his flock. So the young birds are of different ages and sizes. He acts as their guardian and is fiercely possessive over them. This female is the mother of some of his flock. But he'll not allow her to drink here until they have finished. The chicks preen, but keep watch on their guardian to be ready to follow him as he moves elsewhere to feed. They don't want to be left behind. December. Summer in Patagonia. The season of greatest heat begins. There's no shade, but that's no hardship for guanacos. Yearling male guanacos, each pushed out of its family by the dominant male, join existing bachelor herds. An individual may remain with them for five years or so. By chasing each other, they practice their rituals for securing territory, or jockeying for position in this hierarchy of bachelors, as they'll do for real in the future. The family groups keep well clear of any bachelors that might challenge the supremacy of the male. The females have given birth. Their young chulengos are up and running in only a few hours. Their father is watchful. A chulengo is naturally inquisitive. and there is much in Patagonia to be curious about. But when a Chilengo first meets a Mara, courage fails both. The Chilengo's desire to explore is strong. The open space perhaps as inviting as the Sahara to its camel cousins in Africa but there are less comforting sounds in the air. And its family moves so fast it dare not fall behind. There's no scent of rain on the hot wind. It blows steadily offshore, holding the summer storms well out to sea. desolation of Patagonia's coast belies a history of persecution of the animals attracted here to breed. Here were the abattoirs of sealers and whalers, killing for meat, skins and oil. Today, seals and whales are no longer hunted here. About a quarter of the 4,000 or so remaining right whales visit Patagonia each year. Once, they were the most abundant in the world. In December, they set out for unknown feeding grounds somewhere in the South Atlantic. While the whales are leaving, southern sea lions are making for their traditional breeding beaches. A pregnant female is attempting to come a much larger, unattached male attempts to take possession of it. 
several other bachelors of the same idea. On the beach, the team is more orderly. Resident bulls, each in possession of a harem of two to five feet, sit unusually close together. There are hungry pups weaved into this restless colony. It's hard to see where one harem ends and the other begins. But the bulls tell each other. A couple of days after arrival, the females give birth. Pups and mothers know each other by call. This one is lost, and to this mother, his voice says, "Meet her pup," and she sees him off. You have to try again. Trouble will come from these unattached males. Some are as yet unmated. Others are bulls that have lost their heart. None is content with this situation. One of them tries to get to the field to steal one, or even to establish himself in the colony. But the resident males drive him off. Working alone was unsuccessful, so the bachelors gang up together to make a combined raid. This raid is successfully done. Another raid. And in the confusion, another piece plucked from under the nose of a resident bull. She's ready to mate with her abductor, so it seems the only way for an unattached male to acquire a female is to be partnered joint to sword. This raider would probably not have made it without these tactics. She'll give birth to his pup a year from now. It's not easy to understand how the chaotic and disruptive strategy of raiding parties, which enables weaker males to breed, can benefit the colony. And this bit is just as puzzling. Young bachelors, frustrated by their failure to win females, sometimes manhandle pups. In this case, matters seem to have got out of hand. Usually, a kidnapped youngster escapes back into the colony, but this one will not survive such extreme times. In some places, more than the sea gnaws at the walls of Patagonia. Like so many of this country's animals, even parrots have taken to coming. With beaks and claws, burrowing parrots can sink a home up to 12 feet into the soft sandstone. Couples use the same burrows year after year, and even the chicks help extend it, pushing the nest deeper in. They are the only parrots that can nest in stone and several thousand crowd into one stretch of cliff face, a seaside tenement from which they fly miles inland to search for food.
Patagonia is a land ruled by drought. A harsh country of stunted shrubs and meager grasses whipped by winds blowing from the Andes. The rain that the Andes steals from Patagonia is locked in snow and ice. An ice cap smothers 9,000 square miles of the southern Andes. Thousands of years of frozen rain stacked hundreds of feet deep. The mass of ice squeezes glaciers between mountain walls. Inexorable flows of unimaginable weight grind relentlessly to drown in lakes carved deep into the foothills. Two hundred feet high, the frontier of a glacier stands at its limit. A fragile melting wall, constantly nudged by the massive flow of ice from behind. Icebergs melt, releasing rainwater trapped by the Andes perhaps thousands of years ago. But only a few rivers carry it across the Patagonian wilderness, insufficient to water so vast a desert, but enough to feed a few lakes along the way. Chilean flamingos are among those birds that are drawn to such gifts of the Andes. Flamingos travel long distances in Patagonia between these remote lakes. These reliable oases are magnets drawing many birds to them. They feed on aquatic life filtering it from the water. White-cheeked pintails and South American stilts also search for food in water released from cold storage in the Andes. And Wilson's phalaropes are busy in the shallows, stirring up insects with their feet. In a couple of months, they'll set off on their long migration to North America to breed in the summer there, over 7,000 miles from these distant pools. 
At the coast, imperial cormorants are now ferrying fish to their growing chicks. And remarkably, each parent manages to find its family in the crowd. The young birds are quite large and compete with each other for their parents' attention and to trigger the regurgitation of the meal. It's January and the midsummer fishing is good. If the coastal waters of Patagonia need an indicator of richness, this spectacle is it. Up and down the Patagonian coast, the sea's riches are also feeding more than a million Magellanic penguins. The chicks, now about three months old, have both parents at sea catching food. This one is trying to come ashore. It's been feeding up to 20 miles out at sea. It's tired and full of fish. The way up the beach is now hampered by thousands of last year's young. They've recently returned to land to molt into adult plumage. At the moment, they're neither one thing nor the other, and they also prefer to stay out of the cold water. Their feathers are not fully waterproof while molting. They're confined to a platform of soggy seaweed and temporal spray as well as their feathers. But giant petrels stalk the colony, intent on stampeding the penguins into the water. This enables the hungry petrels to watch for stragglers the weak, the sick, or the injured. Also, by clearing the beach, any dead penguins are revealed. The penguins seem undisturbed once the quarrelsome undertakers are at work. This kelp gull is also in the scrap business. It's looking for a parent feeding its chicks. The penguin knows the thief is about and tries not to let the food perhaps hard-won squid from the ocean, be seen as the chick attempts to eat it. But gulls will be gulls. The chick never will be able to fly after it. But flapping its wings shows it's almost ready to go to sea. It's February, and the chicks are starting out on the most hazardous journey of their lives. Getting down to the water's edge is difficult enough, as the beach is full of bullies. Last year's young, who've run this gauntlet before, give the smaller bird the same rough send-off they got a year ago. but the call of the sea overcomes fear. He's never touched it before. Now his first wave is on its way to grab him. There's no turning back once he decides to go. He has 1,500 dangerous miles to swim. Giant petrol menace the fledgling. Some will be taken, 
because they can't yet dive quickly enough, and their swimming is only weak. The vast majority of chicks won't make it. Starvation is the biggest killer. He has yet to try catching his first fish. He's in at the deep end and will spend the next six months on the Atlantic swirl. A few weeks later, the adults face the same journey, north to spend winter in warmer waters off Brazil. Once again, the penguins have bred successfully here. The sea has given its riches, but its waters hide danger as well. At the time of the penguin exodus, the sea lion pups are taking to the water. The South Atlantic offers an exciting playground with easy access from the steep beach where they were born. It's low tide, and the distant rocky reef protects swimmers in this shallow water from the dangers of the open sea. Only a high speed of killer whales or orcas across the reef and approach the shore. But it's at high water that sea lions and their pups confidently take to the swell. They move with a supple grace that only sea lions possess. is swift, sudden, and deadly. It homes in on its prey with pulses of sound. As though expected such deadly attacks, the sea lions appear almost such a terrifying onslaught. An end game in the surf they seem resigned to play in this Patagonia arena. They pass, they take, and they toy with them for a time, like a cat with a mouse. But this may be a mother showing her calf or family how to catch and handle their natural prey at this time of the year. winter approaches, the orcas will turn again to hunting fish, leaving plenty of these remarkable sea lions to breed here next year. Patagonia's wild shore has again served them well, as it has for millions of years. For a moment, all that's most wild and savage in the world seemed focused on the shores of this strange, far-away land in the shadow of the Andes.